From Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents Ginger Rogers, Don Amici, and Charles Winninger in A Free Soul. Lux presents Hollywood. Our sponsors, believing that this program is the best means of showing you their appreciation of your loyalty to Lux. Tonight, bring you Ginger Rogers, Don Amici, Charles Winninger, and Jack Arnold in another great play. You will also hear from Mr. William A. Brady, distinguished Broadway producer, and Adrian, world-famous designer of motion picture styles. Conducting our music is Louis Silvers, and our entire presentation is under the direction of your celebrated host, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Missourians are noted for caution and thoroughness, and Ginger Rogers was born in a Missouri town called Independence. It may be the combination that enables her to do what other girls find impossible. She scored first on the screen as a comedienne, then as the most enchanting of all screen dancers, and her recent performance in Stage Door marks her as one of the most accomplished and delightful actresses in Hollywood. A small girl with golden hair and green eyes Ginger likes ice cream sodas and has installed a complete soda fountain in her new Beverly Hills home. She also likes roller skating, knitting, and saving old wrapping paper. I think I can safely say that it was the Lux Radio Theater that gave Ginger one of her first important opportunities at drama when a year ago we presented, in the Lux, we presented her in The Curtain Rises. She's currently starred for RKO in Having Wonderful Time and tonight enacts the role of Jan in Willard Max melodrama, A Free Soul. Tonight also brings to fulfillment what has long been an ambition of ours, to see Don Amici before our microphone. A radio favorite for several years, he's outstanding in an ever-increasing group of Hollywood stars who are coming to the screen by way of the air. We hear Don as Ace Wilfong, and we're especially happy to present as Stephen Ash, that superb character actor, as famous on the air as he is on the stage and in films, Charles Winninger. Jack Arnold is heard as Dwight Sutro. With this thumbnail introduction to our stars, let's raise the curtain and get to the play. The Lux Radio Theater presents A Free Soul, starring Ginger Rogers, Don Amici, and Charles Winninger. smallest big town in the world, the city of San Francisco. It's late afternoon, and Market Street in the business section is jammed with a tangled mass of traffic, jockeying for position, tooting impatiently at the delay. Suddenly, a long blue roadster sweeps from a side street, skids recklessly beneath the nose of an oncoming truck, and rounds the corner on two screeching tires. Driving a firehouse? That's right, officer. I used to practice on the hook and ladder. What? Oh, well, hello, Miss Ash. <laughs> and how are you? How are you, Tim? I'm fine, yeah, fine. <laughs> Say, that was a neat little piece of driving there. I'm sorry, Tim. I was in a hurry. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> and how's your dad, Miss Ash? Don't see him around very much. Oh, he's fine. I'll give him your regards. Great man, Steve Ash. Ought to be distant to Tony by rights. Put some of these crooks behind the bars. <laughs> he does better keeping them on this side. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what time is it, Tim? It's, uh, 5.45. Oh, I've got to run. Family tea at my aunt. See you around, Tim. Okay, take it easy now. Think I can make Knob Hill in three minutes? If you do, you'll land in the lockup. <laughs> Look me up in cell number six. <laughs> Good evening, Dean. Oh, good evening, Miss Ash. Am I terribly late? Your aunt's waiting in the drawing room, Miss. Hey. I don't take care what you say, Stephen. It's true. Now, wait. Hello, everybody. Oh, Jan, dear. How are you, Aunt Dorothy? Evening, Aunt Grace. Good evening. Hiya, Dad. Hello, Jan. Sit down. Just talking about you. Stephen, please. Well, we were, weren't we? Oh, sounds like I was on the pan. 
Where's Dean? Dean! Yes, Mr. Lash? Fill this glass up, will you? It's been empty for ten minutes. Yes, sir. Dad, I thought this was supposed to be a tea. Now, stop. Stop picking on me. It's sundown, isn't it? Stephen, can't you even come to a family conference without requiring stimulants? My dear sister, what occasion could arise where a man's desire for stimulants would be greater than at a family conference? <laughs> Go on, Dorothy. What was it you were going to say about Jan? Well, since it is about Jan, do you think she should be present to hear herself discussed? Well, I'll have to let Jan answer that. You want to stay, Jen? Of course I do. I wouldn't miss it for worlds. Have you no voice at all in the matter, Stephen? Why should I? Jan ought to know her own mind. She's known it ever since she was five years old. Exactly, and that's just what's brought us where we are today. Where are we today? Your Aunt Grace is referring to certain actions of yours. Public actions. And the people you choose to be seen with in public places. Oh, so that's it. Hmm. I knew this meeting was going to be called today. I knew it last Tuesday when Aunt Grace walked into the St. Auburn for luncheon and saw me there with Ace Wilfong. Ace Wilfong, a common gambler. Oh, wait a minute, wait. Is that what this is all about? Isn't it enough? Are we to stand by and see our family name dragged in the mud? What do you mean, dragged in the mud? Yeah, I'd like that question answered myself. What do you mean, the mud? What mud? The notorious dirty mud which clings to this man your daughter sees fit to be seen with. Oh, that's a laugh. Aunt Grace didn't think he looked so dirty until she found out who he was. Jan. After that, she made everybody's lunch cold for three tables around. <laughs> Even, are you going to allow your daughter to insult me? Is she stating facts? I certainly am. Oh, one moment, please. I have one question, Stephen, that will settle a great deal in my mind. All right, Dorothy. <clears throat> Let's have it. Did you know that Jan knew this gambler? Wilson? Certainly. I introduced him to her. You are? You introduced the man to her? Of course I did. Why not? Jan has met everyone in California who was worth meeting. Every fighter, every jockey, every gambler. Oh, Stephen, do be serious. I am. Since she was old enough to be my pal, she's known everyone I ever knew. And, well, why not? Oh, what does he care about anything? If he chooses to raise a daughter with the manners of a bomb. That's enough, Aunt Grace. I've heard enough. You don't like me, you never have. That makes us even. But don't forget this. No matter how much respect my father shows his sister, that's his debt. I don't owe you anything, and I don't have to answer to you for anything. Jan, dear Jan. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Grace, uh, Dorothy, I don't have to tell you what Jan has been to me all these years since, uh, well, since her mother died. She's been my comrade, my, uh, my pal. I brought her up from a baby, brought her up to face life and face it squarely. Whatever she is, I know she'll always be honest. Whatever she becomes, it'll be her own choice. But right and wrong are not going to be rubber stamped for her. If she's not strong enough to stand it, I'd rather she'd go down fighting than be a namby-pamby, cowardly, mealy-mouthed liar. And you'll do nothing to help her in avoiding temptation? If God has given her an immortal soul, won't it survive temptation? Must it forever be hedged in with a lot of fables that our very ears sicken of? No. And if in the end it strikes us both down, Jan shall be a free soul always. And that I promise you. And I can see there's nothing more to be said. No, nothing, sis. <laughs> Ladies of the jury, the defense rests. Thank heaven for that. It's grand music. Want to dance, Ace? No, not unless you do. What's the matter? Inferiority complex? <laughs> no, no. Common sense, I guess. A lot of friends of yours here tonight. Oh. You're protecting my reputation again, aren't you? I wish you wouldn't, Ace. Why not? Can't do you any good being seen with me so much. Your friends must do plenty of talking. Do you think I care? You should. Maybe. It's a funny combination, you and me. I only hope it never gets you into a jam. Oh, Ace. You're as bad as my aunts and twice as old-fashioned. Oh. Hello, Dwight. Good evening, Jen. Um, coming, Dwight? Oh, yes. Excuse me, please. Friend of yours? Oh, Dwight Sutcrow. Kind of frigid, wasn't he? 
That's what I'm talking about, Jan. I choose my own company, and just now you happen to be it. Thanks. Don't live long? Mm-hmm. All my life. He proposed to me once. Oh. Seems to be all right. <laughs> I thought so, too. But while I was thinking it over, his mother decided she didn't like me. And if he married me, she'd cut him off. That changed his mind. Mine, too. He must sleep bad with that on his conscience. Conscience? Having a chance to marry a girl like you and passing it up for a little jag. A lot of jag. <laughs> Couldn't be enough to square the deal. <laughs> Boys, you're marvelous. <laughs> oh, I've got to call Dad. Uh, wait for me, will you? Sure. I'll only be a minute. Jan. Oh, Jan. Well, the frigid Mr. Sutro. How are you, Dwight? Jan, I, I want to speak to you. You didn't seem so anxious inside. I was until I saw whom you were with. Why are you doing it, Jan? What do you hope to gain by it? Oh, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, if it's just to make me jealous of something. Jealous? Oh, do you think I'd go to the trouble of making you jealous? Then I suppose it doesn't mean a thing to you anymore that we're not the way we used to be? Mm-mm. Not a thing, do I? Well, it does to me. Really? Has your mother changed her mind again? Oh, that's not fair, John. I asked you to wait a little while until I won her over. And suppose you didn't win her over. I'd lose again, wouldn't I? No, Dwight. The man I marry has got to want me more than anything else in the world. Just me. And nothing else must count. I do want you, Jan. Oh, no, you don't. I do. Give me a chance to prove to you how much I do. No, Dwight. It's cold. <laughs> you know what I mean. You don't interest me anymore. Maybe someday I'll think you're swell, and if I do, I'll call you up. Unless you should happen to meet that ideal man of yours in the meantime. Mm, of course. Maybe you've met him already. Perhaps. Ace Wilfong, I suppose. <laughs> you might be right about that, too. Good night, Dwight. <laughs> For last night, boss. The takings were deposited this morning. Okay. Say, the house is doing swell, Ace. Over 4,000 bucks at roulette alone. And there's a crowd out there tonight fighting for the privilege of losing their dough to you. Say, we'll be swimming in it soon. Yeah. Say, look, Gabe. You've known me for a long time. You saw me start this thing, you watched it grow. Yep, that's right. Am I a smart guy, Abe? Or is it just luck? I don't know. Both, I guess. But what I mean is, suppose I'd gone into some other racket, something on the up and up. Would it come along like this, Hayes? Or would I be walking around with holes in my pants? Hey, you ain't thinking of getting out, are you? You can't do that, Ace. I'm thinking of a lot of things. Yeah. We've been watching that here lately. We? Who's we? The boys and me. She's got you running around in circles, ain't she? Shut up, Abe. Now, listen, boss, it's for your own good. These society Shut games, up, they I don't... tell you. You don't talk about her in this place, you get it? You or anyone else. You can spread that around with the boys. If I hear anyone of them even mention her name, I'll pitch them out in his ear. Hey, boss, there's a dame here to see you. Hello, Abe. Jan, what are you... All right, Abe, beat it. Right, okay, Who's come on. Dame? Jan, what's the idea? Well, now, there's a nice reception. What's the matter? Women play here, you told me yourself. Well, sure, but this is no place for you, Jan. I didn't come to play. I came to see a man at his game, Ace. If he's a fighter, I like to see him train. If he's a doctor, I like to see him operate. If he's a gambler, I like to see him gamble. Well, you're not going to see me gamble. You're going home. Oh, don't be silly, Ace. I'm not doing anything wrong. It's not what you're doing. It's what people think you're doing. I do what I like. I'll always do what I like. That's my creed, Ace. Yeah? It may work now. It won't always. Why not? You'll be getting married one of these days. <laughs> Do you think that would make any difference? I wouldn't marry a man who didn't know me well enough to know that if I wanted to do something, it was all right to do it. I see. Well, aren't we having a chummy little talk? We'll continue it later. Hello, oh, tell Jack to bring the car around. I'll be right down. Uh, listen, have the elevator waiting. Come on, Jen. Oh, you, you're being very masterful tonight. We'll leave by the side door. I'm not so sure I like you when you're being such a strong character, Ace. Sorry. No, oh, here's the elevator. Well. Dad. Hello, Jen. How, how are you, Ace? Hello, Steve. Just came up to lose a little odd change. Dad, where have you been? My dear daughter, I had hoped that was not too obvious. I've been wooing Bacchus. I suppose you know the office has been trying to reach you all day. 
Why? You've got to be in court tomorrow at 10 o'clock. I shall be there on the dot. Run along now, run along. Oh, where are you going? There's a game inside called Poker Dice, which after 20 years still intrigues me. <laughs> Good night, Jan. Dad! Hi, Nice, Steve. He'll be all right. I'll tell Abe to look after him. You go along downstairs. I'll see you in the car. Don't be long. Mm, it's such a rotten shame, Ace. He's so brilliant on one side, and, and on the other, he's so overbalanced. He always knows just what other people need, and he, he does it for them. But for himself, he... he can't do anything. Oh, God, it's terrible. Oh, Jan, dear. I watched him ever since I was a little kid. Playing with liquor year after year. It's been working on him. And he doesn't know... He can't see what it's doing to Jan, me. Jan, Jan, please don't. I wish I could help you. I want to, Jan. You can't. No one can. Will you let me try? Somehow? You would, maybe, if... if you knew... how much I love you, Jan. Oh, why did you wait so long to say that? Oh, I've wanted to for weeks... And I've wanted to hear it for months. Jan, you're... You're so far above me, it scares me to think of it. Then, then don't think of it. Oh, you're wonderful, Jan. Will you always say that? Oh, always. I'll take a chance on anything, but when I place a bet on you, that's a sure thing. Jan, will you marry me? Of course I will. I mean, soon. How soon? A week or so? A week? And leave Dad? Oh, he needs me, Ace, now more than ever. He'll always need you. But that's all right. We can all stick together. Live together? Why not? Oh, darling. Oh, oh let me think. I, I'm, I'm not stalling. It's just, just let me think it out all by myself. I'll call you. When? Tonight, late. After... After Dad gets home. And then the gods smiled. <laughs> they beamed. 250 in the hole, and I threw five kings. <laughs> A windfall. <laughs> Where's my glass? Please, Dad, don't. What? No more tonight. I want to tell you something. Something important, Dad. What could be more important than five kings? <laughs> Dad, I'm going to marry Ace Wilfong. What's that? I'm going to marry him. Oh, Jan, you're, you're not serious. Of course I'm serious. I love him. You know what he is, Jan? What he will always be? A gambler? Oh, we know lots of gamblers. And their wives and prize fighters and jockeys and bookmakers. But and... I didn't expect you to marry them. Good Lord, girl, we can associate with anybody, but we don't marry them. That isn't what you taught me. You said a hundred times, Jan, if you aren't ashamed of what you do, and if people see you aren't ashamed, they'll respect you. No, haven't you said that? Oh, no matter what I said, you can't marry Ace Wilfong. Why? Don't you like Ace? Yes, as a man, I like him very much. And as a character, he interests me. But as a husband for my daughter, how can you expect me to like him? He's square. He's clean. He's brave. I believe that. And I, I tell you, Dad, that he loves me and... And I love him. Oh, oh, you've been in love often enough before. Then I ought to know, oughtn't I, Dad? If it, if it were the very first time, I might be mistaken. I tell you, I know, I know. Oh, Jan. I'll never love anyone else. Oh, Dad, please believe me. Jan, Jan. Oh, you can't do this thing, dear. You mustn't do it. Listen, I know I'm no good. I've made you suffer, and I loathe myself for it. But you're all I've got. I can't let you be unhappy, ashamed. You can't marry Ace Wilfong. You say you loathe yourself for making me suffer. Can't you see how you're making me suffer now? 
It's for you I'm doing it. You know I love you, Jan. I'll do better. I promise I'll do better. Dad, we're both gamblers, you and I. No more than that. We've been good gamblers with life always. Now, I want to gamble with you for the limit. Yes? I'll make you a bet, and I'll give you fair odds. I promise you I won't marry Ace Wilfong. I won't, I won't even see him. If you promise me, you'll never drink again. Is it a bet? I give up the man I love because you think he's bad for me. And you give up what you love because, oh, I know it's killing you. Is it a bet, Dad? It's a bet, Jan. Thanks, Dad. The defense rests. Good night, Dad. Good night. Well, if you don't mind, I'd like to be alone. Oh, sure, I know. Sure, honey. Hello? Give me main 0642. Hello? Hello? I'd like to speak to Ace Wilfong, please. We will bring you act two of a free soul in just a moment. In the meantime, we switch our scene to Hollywood to a shop on Sunset Boulevard out near the city limits of Beverly Hills. Inside the shop, a young lady, very much talked of in Hollywood today, is looking over some clothes. A sales girl is helping her. Oh, I think it's so wonderful you're getting that part. I read about you this morning. Well, you're famous. <laughs> Thank you. It is wonderful. But really, all I have time to think about is getting ready to go on location. I have practically no warm clothes. What about sweaters? Let me show you some of our new cashmeres. They're really lovely. Oh, I adore that one. It's so marvelously soft and light. And it fits so nicely, too. Yes, but it would only stay just as nice. Oh, but it will if it's washed right. Here are the directions right on the tag. Use cool water and Lux flakes. Would you wash a sweater like that? Oh, yes. Washing is good for wool, provided you use Lux. Sweaters shouldn't be rough with a cake soap. They may shrink right up and get stiff and harsh. I know. Marie uses Lux for my lingerie and stockings. Well, if she'll just stick to Lux of sweaters, too, she'll keep the colors nice and the fit perfect. You see, there's no rubbing with Lux flakes. And it hasn't any harmful alkali in it either, the way some soaps have. Anything safe in plain water is safe in Lux flakes, you know. All right, I'll take it. And just so I don't forget, I'll stick a memo in my purse. Marie, take along plenty of of big boxes of Lux. Now let's look at coats. We return now to Mr. DeMille and our play. We resume A Free Soul, starring Ginger Rogers, Charles Winninger, and Donna Michi. For six long weeks, Steve was faithful to his pledge and Jan to hers. It's late at night now, and in Jan's room, a single light is burning. The girl paces the floor nervously. And turns quickly as she hears someone at the door. Who is it? Dad. Oh, Dad, I've been worried about you. Where have you been? Jan. Oh, Dad. Oh, Dad. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Oh, you've Jan. broken your pledge. You promised. I know that, but that's why I came up here. You know what you said. You know what I said. You know what we agreed, Dad. I know. I'm going to marry him. You've broken your part of the bargain. You can't stop me now. I'm licked, Jan. It's licked me, but I tried. Oh, I tried. Dad. You could have gone upstairs. I never would have known. Sure, but that that wouldn't be playing the game fair, would it? Oh, Dad. <laughs> On the front page, too. Jan asked to wed Ace Wilfong. <laughs> Looks like we're right, honey. <laughs> it's the combination. Jan asked to wed Ace Wilfong. Anything wrong, Dwight? Oh, no, no. Not a thing. It's swell with me. Paper, Mr. Ash? Oh, 
All right, go out, please. Jan Ash to wed Ace Wilfong. Oh. Hello? Oh, hello, darling. Where are you? Oh, were you coming home to dinner? Oh, Ace, why not? Well, I know it's business, darling, but it's ages since I've seen you. Well, not since last night, Ace. Oh, please. Well, but I've invited some people over. Oh, I see. All right, Ace. Oh, I know you're sorry. All right. I'll be up when you get home. Clara. Yes, ma'am? Mr. Wilfong won't be home to dinner. Call up everyone. Say I'm sick or something. Yes, ma'am. Oh, uh, Mr. Sutro called again. Do I? What did he say? He asked if you'd have tea with him this afternoon. I told him you were busy. Oh. Oh, well, uh, well, call him back. Tell him I'm not as busy as I thought. Two hundred. Yeah, yeah. Sure that's enough, Steve? Sure, I'll have this back to you in a couple of days, Ace. And the other, too. Things haven't been so hot here lately. Uh, but they'll be picking up... Oh, the... forget it. Uh, you seen anything of Jan? Uh, Jan's a little disappointed in me these days. What do you mean? Well, she kind of guessed I was making a few loans from you and kind of got her pride. <laughs> Why, should it's all in the family? She sees it a little differently, Ace. Uh, she sees it as a man taking money from the fellow he didn't want his daughter to marry. Oh. You didn't know that, did you? Uh, that I didn't want her to marry you. Oh, I guess I did. I wasn't sure why, though. Well, you understand horses, Ace, don't you? Yeah, some. Well, humans are the same. It, it, it was the, the blood... Uh, I didn't want to cross it. You figured my breeding wasn't right, hmm? Well, what I meant was I knew her strain and I didn't know yours. Can't man be a thoroughbred unless he's got a name they know for a thousand years? Sure he can. And you're proving that to me every day, proving I was wrong. Uh, <laughs> I'm not talking about the money either. You know that. Oh, forget that. But you were right, too, in a way. I mean, if I was... Bread, right? Yeah. Your strain. Yeah. I know more about things. I wouldn't have to ask about... Well, about something that's been on my mind for, for a long time. Well, let's hear it. Now, this isn't a squawk, Steve. I, I just want you to put me right. Well? Is it okay, now that Jan's my wife... Is, is it supposed to be correct for her to let guys who knew her before she was married... Keep on hanging around. Does she? Well? Well, is it all right? Yes, it's all right. Why not? But she's my wife. Has she done anything not worthy of a wife? She goes out riding with this guy. Well, because she married you, should, should that keep her from motoring on a nice day in nice company? He is a nice company. I met him. He's a rat. I think you know what I'm talking about. I, I wouldn't let it worry me. Jan's the skipper of her own boat. She must know what she's doing. Yeah? I hope so. That's you, Jan? Darling, I didn't know you were here. You're home early tonight. Oh, that's more than I can say for you. <laughs> here, take my wrap, will you, darling? Sure, sure. Oh, I'm tired. We were dancing at the Three Spades. Dwight Sutro? Yes. Why? That's three times in a week, isn't it? Well, why not? I've, I've got to do something. I can't just sit here every night waiting. You wouldn't expect me to. No. Ace, but... we've been married eight months. And all during those eight months, I think you and I were out together every bit of six times. We saw three shows, two ball games, and one rotten fight. Now, if that isn't a record for a pair of great lovers, I don't know. Oh, I know it's been tough for you, darling. For me, too. But I've had to stick close to the place, Jan, to wind things up. 
What? I'm getting out next week, selling the place. Ace, no. Sure, it's no life for you, stuck with a gambler. I'm going into something else, something on the up and up. I've got enough dough to start with, and, well, maybe we get to see each other once in a while. Oh, darling, that's marvelous. You're doing this just for me, aren't you? For us. But you can do something for me, if you want. Well, of course, darling. What? <laughs> well, I, I don't know how to say it without sounding silly, but uh, it, it, it'd make me a lot happier if you weren't so chummy with this Sutro guy. Well, it does sound silly, Ace. I told you before we got married I had to be free. I don't consider it necessary to account for myself to anyone. But this much I'll tell you. I should have gone mad these months without Dwight. As bad as that, hmm? As bad as that. There's no harm in going places. Dwight and I were kids together. Why? Oh, I know what he is, but he's harmless where I'm concerned. If I could believe that, I wouldn't beef. I want you to be free, Jan, but isn't, isn't there some other freedom that's a little less like playing with nitroglycerin? Ace, I won't be bossed, and that's that. Oh, no, it isn't. No, Jan, you've got to give me something else besides this free soul stuff. That don't mean anything to me. That was all right for you and your dad, but not for me. That agreement between dad and me was our faith, our faith in each other. Ace, I wouldn't live with you two minutes if I thought you didn't trust me. I do. That's why I can't have other people thinking what I know isn't so. I won't have it. I warned you never to treat me as you would any other girl you've ever known. You don't understand my training, and you don't understand my code. And you don't understand mine. What I win belongs to me. Do you get that? Me. And I won't allow anybody to throw crooked dice in the game I'm in. And you're mine, and the game is mine, and this rat is out to break it up for me. But he won't, you see? Take your hands off of me. Don't you ever do that again, Ace. And don't ever try to bully me into anything. I've done what I felt like doing all my life. I'll go on doing it. And if I want to see Dwight Sutro as long as it's honest and clean, you've nothing to say about it. Do you hear nothing? All right. I won't bother you again. Where are you going? I'm going out. Where? You said I wouldn't bother you. Ace! Satro? Well, I... Do you mind if I come in? Why, no. Uh, of course not. Make yourself comfortable, Will Fong. Thanks. I'm not staying. Oh, long enough to have a drink? Not even that. I can say what I came to say in a couple of words. Yes? Satro, I want you to stay away from my wife. I haven't wanted to say that. You forced my hand. But stay away from it, you hear? I hear, yes. And you will or else. You don't know much about men like me, but... Maybe you can figure out what I mean by that. Well? I'll see your wife just as often as she'll allow me to see her. It's entirely her affair. And mine. She's married to me. That, I should say, is her misfortune. But she's entitled to some happiness. And if she favors the company of a man of her own world, then I shall do my best to be that company. And just what can you do about it? I can do this about it. If you ever go near my wife again, I'll kill you. Remember that. The private dick just reported. Well, what did he say? Now, listen, boys, you don't want to get so... What did he say? Well, he's been trailing Sutro since Wednesday. Today, about 3 o'clock, Sutro gets in his car and goes up to the house. Go on. Well, I... I... My wife went out with him? Yeah. Yeah, they went out for a ride or something. But look, boss, maybe... Shut you know up. You... Well, I just... Shut up. To... When he calls again, tell him to keep on the job. I want to know every move Sutro makes. You get it? I got it. Dwight, I felt a drop of rain. Oh, it's all right. We'll be at Thwaites in a couple of minutes. Oh, don't you think we'd better put the top up? We'll be drenched. <laughs> you won't melt. Oh, Dwight, please. Oh, all right. If it'll make you feel any better. Hurry, Dwight. Look out, look out. Oh, Here she comes. Oh, goodness. Oh, well, now I hope you're satisfied. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jan. Look at my dress. I can't go to Thwaites looking like this. Come on. We'll go and get dried out. Where are we going? My place. It's only a minute. Hold tight. There you are. Put your feet up on the fireplace. Oh, I feel like a sponge. One sharp twist and I could wring myself out. I must be a sight. Don't you believe it. 
You look beautiful. With water trickling off my chin, I'll just bet I do. You'll always look beautiful to me, Jan. You know that, don't you? It's very kind of you, I'm sure. Don't, Jan. Don't what? Don't keep putting me off like that. You shouldn't, you know. We can't just go on laughing and pretending forever. It's not a laughing matter. Not with me. I love you, Jan. Give me a cigarette, please. Oh. Oh, of course. I wish you hadn't said that, Dwight. Why? Well, it's been such fun being with you. Now you've spoiled it. Because I told you I loved you? That's not the first time I've said it. It's the first time since I've been married to Ace. I'd like to believe it's the last. It isn't. I'll never stop telling you. Then I'm sorry for you. And sorry for our friendship. You see, Dwight, I love my husband. Oh, how can you say that? You're not happy with him. But I am. Oh, Jan, dear, don't be a fool. I thought you were above petty little conventionalities. He's not your kind, Jan. And you are, I suppose. I love you. I could make you happy. Oh, Jan, darling. Will you get my coat, please? Jan. I'm leaving. I'm sorry, Dwight. It seems I've, I've led you into believing something about me that isn't true. My coat, please. You, you can't just leave it at that. I can, and I'm going to. Good night. Jan. Jan, darling, listen Let me to go. Me. I won't. You don't mean what you're saying. You're putting on an act. You're... Maybe that'll prove to you that it isn't an act. That it never has been, that it never will be. Hello? Who? Abe who? All right, put him on. Hello? Hello, talk louder, please. Who's on his way? Oh, I can't hear you. Will you please tell me what you're talking about? All right, Sutro, where is she? May I ask what you're doing here and what you mean by Don't breaking Don't give me that. Where is she? She was here a minute ago. You're mad. Oh, no, I'm not. I've had you followed for a week. You brought her here. Now, where is she? Get out of here. I warned you, Sutro. You wouldn't listen to me. I warned you. Stay away from me. Stay away. Don't or... reach for a gun, Sutro. Don't reach for a gun or I'll let you have it. What I'm going to do to you, I can do with my own two hands. You let go of me. Get away from that drawer. Hello. Give me the police, will you? Sergeant, this is Ace Wilfong. Send somebody up here right away. I've just killed a man. We pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. producers the American stage has ever known, William A. Brady, would be a most welcome guest on any program of the Lux Radio Theater. His presence tonight between the acts of our play is doubly appropriate, for he not only brought a free soul to Broadway, but during its run there, enacted the role of Stephen Ash. His countless other hits include such immortals as Way Down East and Trilby. Husband of Grace George and father of Alice Brady, Mr. Brady's life reads like the history of the theater. One of the giants of the sporting world, too. He revolutionized boxing during the years that he managed the famous, famous champion, Gentleman Jim Corbett. On the stage, his champions included David Warfield, Catherine Cornell, Helen Hayes, Mary Nash, Henry Hull, and Douglas Fairbanks. The Lux Radio Theater extends its stage to, to New York City and brings you William A. Brady. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. It's the privilege of a young man to look forward and an old man to look back. I've been close to the theater since the days of Edwin Gould. I've seen motion pictures grow from nothing at all into an international pastime. And radio, from a howling, static-filled discord to its statue of perfection, exemplified by the Lux Radio Theater, the sponsors of which, by the way deserve tremendous credit for the part that they have taken in the present rejuvenation of the American theater. In my youth, variety was the spice of life. For example, some 30 years ago, I managed a heavyweight championship fight on one night, 
and presented Robert B. Mantell in his first performance of King Lear on the following night. People often ask me, what was my proudest moment? Well, it was at the time that I made Helen Hayes a star or discovered Douglas Fairbanks or the night when Corbett knocked out the mighty John L. Sullivan. It could be any of these, but down in my heart I still feel the thrill never since duplicated that came to me as a skinny, ragged little boy. It was the night that I sat in the old Boo Theater on 23rd Street, and when, from my seat in the last row of the top gallery, I heaved a marble during the sleep-walking scene of Macbeth and scored a direct hit on the bass drum miles below me in the orchestra pit. Now, that's one way of making a hit in the theater. Most of my life since then has been working for hits from behind the footlights. There is one honor there that I share with Lux Flakes, for they've played a star role backstage in many a Broadway hit. As a producer, I know they are the tops in wardrobe department. Today, it's the Hollywood custom to take athletes and turn them into actors. <laughs> well, it's nothing new, my friends, nothing new. It started long, long ago in the golden days of boxing when Jim Corbett would play Armand in Camille and John L. Sullivan would stand them up in honest hearts and willing hands. Many youngsters claim that there are few fields not overcrowded today. But let a young fella bust loose. Let him find a spot that's not so crowded. Let him take a chance, and luck or stubbornness will see him through. After all, it looks very much like the same old world to me. My congratulations to you, Mr. DeMille, to Miss Rogers, to Mr. Winninger, and to Mr. Amici for giving a play very dear to my heart. My congratulations to Lux Flakes, and to all the people who buy Lux and so make such a superb presentation possible. Thank you. Thank you, William Brady. We're back in Hollywood now, where a free soul with Ginger Rogers, Donna Michi, and Charles Winninger is continued. <laughs> It's early the next morning. In his cell in the city jail, Ace is seated on the edge of an iron cot, his shoulders drooping, his head in his hands. Suddenly, he hears footsteps in the corridor and springs to his feet, every nerve alert. Five minutes, miss. Thank you. Oh, Ace. Jim. Oh, Ace, darling, what have I done to you? Shh. It's, it's all right, honey. Now, don't cry. I killed a rat, that's all. Oh, why did you? There was nothing Ace, wrong, Ace, I swear it. You've got to believe that. Regardless of what happens, you've got to know that, Ace. I do know it. That's what makes this bearable, Jan. I never doubted you. Not down deep, I didn't. I was just all on fire inside. I didn't go there to kill him. Just to give him a scare. He went for a gun. Oh, how can life do such things to people? I love you, Ace. I've never loved anyone but you. I wish I could take my heart out and show it to you. Shh, please, please. It's my fault. Everything is my fault. I thought I was a free soul, and I'm not. Because I belong to you. It came to me last night when you didn't come home, and then, then I heard, and I thought about you here and me there. Oh, I died, Ace. I died, I tell you, if I ever live again, honey, I... Honey, honey, please stop it. You, you don't know what you're saying. Look at me. I'll be all right. Everything's going to be all right. Oh, it will, Ace. It's got to be. They never hanged a man for a thing like this. I was up there to Sutro's yesterday. And when the jury knows that, they're... Wait, Jan. Listen. You, you've got to promise me something. Anything, Ace? I am... You mustn't spill that stuff about being up there, Jan. You know what I mean. It'll... It'll seem tough, but... That's the way I'm going to play it. You mean you... You wouldn't let me go on the stand to save you? Yeah, that's just what I mean. What the... No, sweet, we can't. You married me against the wishes of everyone, even your father. 
No matter what happens to me, we can't use your good name to save my neck. My good name? Oh, you poor crazy darling. Do you think that means anything if you're taken away from me? Oh, no, Ace. I'd yell it from the top of the ferry building that I was there. That it was my fault. No, you won't. I fixed it so you won't. You're not going on the stand. Who can stop me? Your father. He's going to defend me. Dad? Oh, no, Ace, you can't. Oh, he's my father, but... But I know he... He can't save you. He's through, Ace. He hasn't had a case in months. He... Well, he couldn't even plead one. I'm laying a bet on him. Can't you? Oh, I see. You don't care about being saved. You're letting him defend you because you know he'll... He'll never let me testify. No, no, Jane. It's true. You've no confidence in him yourself. You couldn't have. If he does what I asked, that's all I want. And when you arrived, officer, you say Dwight Sutrow was already dead. Uh, that's right. And, uh, and Wilfong was standing by the window looking out. Mm -hmm. And what happened then? Well, he, he handed me the gun and he said, here's the gun that killed him. It's mine. I did it. Thank you. Your witness, Mr. Ash. Mr. Ash, the attorney for the state has offered the witness. No questions, your answer. Do I understand, Mr. Ash, that you have no wish to cross-question any of the state's witnesses? Uh, yes, your honor. Very well. Witness is excused. The defense will proceed with this case. Call your first witness. If it pleases the court... There will be no witnesses for the defense. What's that? Your Honor, the defense rests. No, no! No, Your Honor, you can't let him do it. Jan! Jan, go back to your seat. I won't. They're trying to protect me, Your Honor. They won't let me take the stand because they know what I'll say, that I was in Dwight Sutro's apartment the night he was shot. Jan! That my husband knew I was there. That's why he came. Your Honor, I asked the court's permission oh, to speak please. for a moment with my wife. The prisoner will not address the bench. But, Your Honor... I yet. Quiet, please. Young lady, will you please take your seat? Mr. Ash, do you wish to present this young woman as a witness? Oh, Dad, please, please, you've got to. You don't know what you're doing. Jan, well, Mr. Ash? The defense rests, Your Honor. There will be no witnesses. <laughs> Has the state concluded its case? We have, Your Honor. And the attorney for the defense will sum up, please. Thank you. Your Honor, gentlemen of the jury, you have seen in this court a man on trial for his life. A man accused of the foulest of crimes. Premeditated murder. Murder in the first degree, for which there is but one penalty. Death. You have heard witnesses for the prosecution and none for the defense. You have seen a young woman, my own daughter, rise in defense of her husband and tell you... I object, Your Honor. The woman was not a witness. Her testimony was not entered into evidence. Objection sustained. Proceed, please. Uh, the district attorney is right, gentlemen. You must strike from your minds everything that that woman said. Strike it from your heart if you can. You heard that woman. You know she spoke the truth. And you know that if you bring in a verdict of guilty, you will be placing a rope around the neck of an innocent man. Objection. There's been no evidence by the defense to prove the accused innocent. Objection overruled. I take it Mr. Ash is dealing in certain... Uh, Attendant circumstances? Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Attendant circumstances. Circumstances not born of the moment, day or hour, but...
but wicked, profane, and damnable teachings. Look at that girl, the wife of the accused. You wouldn't think that that child's mind was full of poisonous fallacies. It's God's truth, for since she was old enough to listen, I have dinned into her ears that she was a free soul. I told her she must not be a hypocrite or a coward. I cried out to her that she must follow her desires and be honest and open with them. These were my teachings. And may God forgive me. She had no mother. Could we expect her to see that her father was a mountebank, a trickster, a fool? Her desires, innocent as they might have been, led her into the company of another man, despite the wishes of her husband. Are you beginning to see who is the guilty man? Do you reason now who should be on trial here today? I, Stephen Ash. Ace Wolfong held the pistol, but my hand pulled the trigger. There's only one freedom, knowing and obeying God. There never has been but one man big enough to be a free soul on this earth, and they nailed him to a cross. But he forgave, yes. And that's what I'm asking you to do today. I ask you to forgive this man. I ask my daughter to forgive me. Oh, Dad, Dad. Gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a decision? We have. We find the defendant not guilty. <laughs> Not guilty. Ace, Ace, darling. Oh, Jim, dear. He did it for us, Jim. He gave us our life again. Oh, Dad, Dad, look at me. You were wonderful, darling. And I do forgive you. Oh, I forgive you everything. Dad. Dad, don't you hear me? Well, don't... Don't just sit there, darling. Wait a minute. Steve. Steve, what, what what's the matter? Ace. Steve. Ace. Is he? Please don't, Jan. He's happy. The defense rests. So we take leave of a free soul. So later we'll hear again from Ginger Rogers, Donna Maitri, and Charles Weninger. Adrian, the screen's most famous fashion designer, tonight makes a return engagement in the Lux Radio Theater. A Connecticut Yankee who started on the stage with Irving Berlin, he was brought to Hollywood by Mrs. Rudolph Valentino. It's he who designs the screen clothes at Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Studios for such renowned beauties as Norma Shearer, Joan Crawford, Greta Garbo, Myrna Loy, Jeanette MacDonald, and Louise Reiner. When he last, he mentioned the fashion influence Greta Garbo exerted in Camille. And now, Adrian, that she's completed our new film, Conquest, would you say that she maintains her leadership? Yes, I do. And one of the more interesting fashion influences of Conquest is a little black velvet cap that looks as if it were a snail shell. Does that sound particularly ridiculous? Now, it would have a few years ago, but today, for the sake of peace in the family, I take the funniest hat seriously. So do I. And this is about the only period in history in which a woman can put the most ridiculous-looking contraption on her head, look in the mirror, and accept it seriously. Hats were never so humorous, but strangely enough, they're accepted even by husbands. Not accepted, tolerated. My own feeling about extraordinary hats is that they're far more interesting than humorous. An unusual hat, carefully selected, brings out a woman's personality. She becomes an individual instead of a conventional type. Getting back to Garbo... 
She's a very important style influence, simply because she's not at all interested in style. Therefore, I can design anything that I think will look well on her, and if she agrees about it, she'll wear it regardless of fashion, and it will usually start a new trend. Most women don't want to start a new trend. They want to play follow the leader. Right. The majority are very antagonistic to a new fashion. It's only after they've seen a new style worn by their favorite actress, by the best-dressed woman at their club, and finally by their favorite enemy, that they decide to take a chance with it themselves. Well, how do you account for this being the most lavish season in woman's dress for 20 years? Is it an indication of good times? Well, on the contrary, a lavishness in dress, a willingness to indulge in unusual ideas, are always apparent when the world seems on the edge of something momentous. How accurate this barometer is, I can't say. But whenever international affairs are unsettled, extravagance in fashions will blossom forth amazingly. There's another reason, too, which I hope is truer. It's the fact that today the old law of what they're wearing no longer exists. Most women are at last dressing according to what happens to become them best as individuals. Now, from all I hear, Adrian, Miss Garbo's new picture is going to be one of Hollywood's greatest. What can you tell us about it? Well, if for no other reason, Conquest is a great picture because while it's a story of Napoleon, played by Charles Boyer, never in the entire picture does Napoleon put his hand inside of his coat. The reason is quite unromantic. We found that Napoleon suffered from dyspepsia. And the only time he stuck that, struck that so-called characteristic pose was when he had a stomachache. <laughs> Thousands of costumes were made for conquest, and thanks to Lux Flakes, they remain perfect through the weeks of production and look as new today as when they were created. When you see conquest or any other film and you discover fashion ideas you'd like to copy, just remember that picture styles are created with three things in mind. They must be historic, historically accurate, they must become the star, and they must create certain dramatic effects. So don't take them too literally. Be conservative, and you'll be well-dressed. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. <laughs> the number three has a charm, and here's a charming trio. Ginger Rogers, Donna Michi, and Charles Winninger. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. And as the old-timer here, C.B., I want to say what a pleasure it's been playing tonight with two of the greatest youngsters in pictures. Mm -hmm. I'd include you, Charlie, and make it three of the greatest youngsters. Oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> but it was only a few, well, a very short time ago that Ginger was starting her career on the musical stage and Don was just another unknown radio actor. This gives me a chance, Charlie, to ask a question I'm sure is in the minds of many in our audience. Tell us, Ginger, now that you've made Stage Door and are in the middle of another non-musical picture with a third one to follow that, does it mean you're through with singing and dancing pictures? Mm -hmm. By no means, Don. What I want is variety. And now that I've had it, I'm looking forward to doing a musical again. This has been a very happy year for me, and I only hope it has been equally happy for all of our listeners. <laughs> and there's only one more thing I want to say. The last time I was here, C.B., I said that all I did in Hollywood was play Papa. Well... <laughs> Uh, just let me be Papa to Ginger and you, Don, and I'll never complain again. Thanks, Sally. And I'll... Good night, Mr. DeMille. Good night, good night, good night. you three youngsters. <laughs> Mr. DeMille returns to the exciting news of next week's playing stars. Our cast tonight included Claire Whitney as Dorothea, Myra Marsh as Grace, Edward Marr as Abe, Eddie Kane as Charlie, Lou Merrill as District Attorney, Norman Field as Judge, James Eagles as Officer, Justina Wayne as The Maid, Sally Creighton as Secretary, Frank Nelson as Foreman, and Ken Chevelle as a Newsboy. Mr. Amici appeared through courtesy of the makers of Chase and Sanborn Coffee and 20th Century Fox Studios, where our conductor, Louis Silvers, was in charge of music for the new film, Alibaba Goes to Town. Mr. Arnold is from RKO Studios. Our producer is from Paramount Studios, and here he is. Next Monday night, the Lux Radio Theater presents one of the most popular figures of motion pictures and radio, making his first appearance before our microphone, Bing Crosby. <laughs> Sharing our sp spotlight with the nonchalant Mr. Crosby is that lovely and delightful comedian, Miss Joan Blundell. <laughs> We've been fortunate in securing for their vehicle <laughs> a brisk and sparkling collegiate comedy that was heartily cheered on both stage and screen. She loves me not. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Bing Crosby and Joan Blondell in She Loves Me Not, featuring Nan Gray. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. The announcer is Melville Lewis. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.